From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff. This morning, we're joined by Ryan McMichael, the Director of Sensors and Systems for Advanced Hardware at Zoox, to talk about the current and future state of autonomous vehicles and mobility as a service. This episode is brought to you by Mauser Electronics, a global authorized distributor offering the world's widest selection of the newest semiconductors and electronic components. Ryan, thanks for joining us today. I'm curious, is technology something you always knew you wanted to do or were there other avenues that you explored? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I, I always was interested in in math and science just in in high school. Um, but as far as my my main focus, you know, I actually uh, had originally intended to to go to college for jazz performance. Uh, so I was, you know, considering different programs there. Um, but uh, but I had a, a math teacher uh, in high school, especially towards the end of high school, that. Uh, really did kind of inspire me. Um, you know, he had um, some really cool life experiences that he shared and everything else and um, just got me really into engineering. So uh, when the time came, decided uh, ultimately to do uh, to do programs that had both uh, or to apply to universities that had programs in both music and engineering. It's really interesting to me to see how engineers and jazz tend to gravitate to each other. I was in the jazz band in school too. I played bass. We didn't have music majors, though, so it was all just a bunch of engineers who were playing music for fun. But you actually did some jazz performance studies, is that right? Yeah, uh, I, I played in, um, so I was at the University of Rochester um, yeah, for college, and, and I played in their uh, lab jazz ensemble, um, which was sort of like, uh, kind of like what you were describing. Um, it was the uh, ensemble, you know, that anyone could audition for. Um, and so, you know, folks that were engineering majors, for example, at least had the opportunity to audition for it. And so, um, I participated in that, um, you know, and, and was, was fortunate to sort of explore both the engineering side and a bit of the music side, uh, throughout my studies. And you ended up focusing on optics in school. How did that come to be? It's kind of a, it seems like a bit of a niche subject to study for undergrad. How, how did that happen? Yeah, uh, so optics was uh, it was a bit of a, a happy accident. So um, I remember, you know, when I first started at U of R, I was was looking at electrical engineering, um, and on the the first day of orientation, uh, everybody was grouping up with their academic advisor, and uh, mine happened to be uh, out of the office. So uh, so I hopped in line with with some uh, some excited folks and followed them. Uh, we ended up going to. Um, the, the optics building and their advisor uh, explained to everybody kind of what optics was. And uh, I remember just thinking, you know, this seems really, really challenging, really fascinating, um, you know, something that, that you could, you know, build a career around and really innovate and um, just got really excited about it. Um, so I uh, went up to, went up to them after that presentation and asked to switch my major. <laughs> did, did that, how did they respond to that? Were they like, yeah, we're happy to, to pull you over from the engineering group. What did that look like? They said, they said don't tell your academic advisor that, <laughs> that we swayed you. <laughs> but, um, but no, it was, it was, it was totally cool. They were, uh, they were happy to accommodate and, uh, and it ended up being a really, really great program. So. And then that leveraged into a career for you. Can you talk about, you know, grad school and internships that you might've had? Yeah. Uh, in, uh, all throughout undergrad, I, um, made an effort to try and do some internships to get into the space and, and kind of figure out what I wanted. You know, I wasn't sure big company, small company, you know, what kind of, kind of environment. And so, um, so I did an internship, um, at, uh, NASA for a couple of years at the Goddard space flight center in Maryland. Cool. Um, and then I did a couple of years, uh, as an intern at, uh, APL at the Johns Hopkins applied physics lab. And, um, you know, ended up uh, finishing out uh, my my senior year as an, an intern there, uh, and then uh, was fortunate enough to get a, a full time offer to to go there after school. So I ended up starting there uh, afterwards. And what projects were you working on when you first started at APL? I uh, was working on well, I was in the space department, so it was all um, space science instrumentation. Uh, that was the group that I was in. Um, we worked on a variety of projects ranging from earth remote sensing, uh, stuff like orbiting around the earth, looking back at the earth, 
um, to high altitude balloons, um, which are, aren't even in orbit, right. But, but do a lot of meaningful science, uh, and then ranging all the way to interplanetary stuff. So we had spacecraft and instrumentation, um, that, uh, flew by uh, Pluto, uh, the new horizons, um, mission from NASA. So a uh, wide range of things there and, and some really cool opportunities. So what does it feel like to have your hardware flown or deployed? Uh, really exciting feeling. Um, I mean, all the work leading up to launch, you know, it, it, it can be very stressful, you know, people running around. It's, it's, it's a lot of like, Oh, did we check all the boxes? Is everything going to work? Did we validate it? Um, you know, and then you launch the thing and, uh, uh, the work doesn't stop there. You know, it's, it's definitely a nail biter when you see the thing going up and, and you <laughs> hope that everything goes right. And according to plan, um, if it does, it's, it's definitely, you know, uh, very cathartic. It's a big sigh of relief. Um, you can really, uh, everyone in the room, you know, you just see the kind of the fruits of everybody's labor kind of come, come through there. And, um, at the end of the day, you know, we had, um, you know, a number of successful, uh, launches, uh, while I was there and, uh, the scientists get some really great data. You know, you can really uh, learn some new things and, and kind of push the envelope. So, a uh, really exciting moment. Awesome. I heard you also worked on balloons, which is something I find a lot of people don't associate with, with space and, you know, low Earth sort of research. Yeah, that's right. Um, we, uh, we had some high altitude balloon programs at APL. Those were, you know, definitely some of my best uh, memories while I was there. Um, those balloon programs are, are pretty incredible. Yeah. I got to tour the, at the wallops facility out on the East coast, they have a whole balloon set up. Did you have to like spend Christmas in Antarctica or anything like that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I didn't go to Antarctica. Uh, definitely some folks that I worked with did, um, Antarctica, Karuna, uh, in, uh, I think it's in Sweden. Um, I, uh, I ended up going to New Mexico. So uh, th they launched these balloons from pretty you know remote locations, and the middle of the desert in New Mexico is one of them. Uh, so that was that was exciting. I, any any stories or anything you can share about that time that was either especially challenging from an engineering perspective, or just you know maybe something went really sideways. <laughs> yeah. Um, Maybe I could give like a quick overview of, uh, you know, what these balloon projects are kind of about. And I can talk yeah. to some of the challenges. Um, these, uh, these high altitude balloons, they, they support pretty large payloads. So, you know, you end up mounting a gondola to them that holds the instrument and it's about the size of a small school bus. So these are pretty big things and they carry the, they carry the payload up to about like 120,000 feet. Uh, something like, you know, above like 99.5% of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, we were doing, for our program, we were doing ultraviolet, visible and infrared imaging, and we were looking out um, at comets. So we were looking at uh, comets, um, asteroids, planets, different things in those wavelength ranges. Um, since the balloons don't go into orbit, you, you uh, don't need a big rocket, so you save a lot on schedule and cost, and you can still do some pretty cool science. Um, one of the big challenges though, is the imaging that we did in the infrared. So the payload itself, it has a, a thermal emission in the infrared. Um, and that signature competes with the signal that we're trying to measure from the comets, uh, and other, you know, bodies. Uh, so we had to go to great lengths to cool down the instrument using, uh, like cryogenic systems and that sort of thing so that we could, uh, successfully produce images. Fascinating. So uh basically putting cryo chambers up in almost or it's not orbit it's is there a term for that yeah it's um you know you're basically at float altitude so you're you're kind of hovering at 120,000 feet you sort of go wherever the wind takes you basically um you kind of drift uh and whenever the balloon gets near in our case we were in New Mexico so whenever the balloon uh, ended up near a big enough city you basically cut it down they uh, deploy some charges and basically, you know, the balloon, uh, the payload falls off and then falls to the ground on parachutes. That's exciting. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. probably a little nerve wracking to see it and hope it, hope it lands. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the recoveries, I mean, you know, uh, we were, it's always a little uncertain where it's going to fall. Um, but, uh, the recoveries that, that we had at least, um, were, were successful. You can recover the payload and then reuse it. So, uh, we would basically recover the thing and and then fly it again, you know, one or two years later. Fascinating. And then 
once it touched down, I assume it wasn't self-driving itself back home. How did you transition from balloons to automotive? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, APL was an awesome experience. It was really great to to be there working with those you know super smart people on on some really challenging aerospace problems. But at the end of the day, I was just looking for something a little bit different. Um, you know, wanted to try a different challenge. Um, that kind of led me uh, towards the autonomous vehicle space. Uh, definitely recognize that as a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. You know, make a big impact on transportation. Fundamentally, kind of change the way people move around and. Um, that seemed like, you know, as far as sensors go, they are a key enabler to that. So that seemed like a really exciting opportunity. So can you give us a little introduction to Zooks and what you do there and what you do as a company? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, we started about eight years ago. Uh, one of the coolest things about Zooks, uh, is that our mission has essentially remained unchanged in that time. So, we're an autonomous vehicle company. We're focused on bringing mobility as a service to dense urban environments. So starting with cities. Um, from the very beginning, we've been uh, committed to creating our own purpose-built robo-taxi. So that's one key differentiator for us. Um, and, uh, you know, we've designed that from the ground up with the technology, you know, the sensor suite and everything else, uh, safety and, and user experience all in mind, um, you know, from the very get-go. Um, my my role, you know, within the company, I, I started working, um, you know, on, on optical problems uh, as an optics engineer. Um, I'm currently the the director of our sensor engineering and, and systems engineering teams for advanced hardware. Awesome. So, can you introduce me to the concept of mobility as a service, and what sort of impact you think that will have, and what sort of role that will play in the future? Yeah, I'm, you know, at the end of the day, um, transportation is fundamentally broken. Um, and, that, and that's kind of a tenant, you know, that, that we take very seriously. And you look at a few statistics, one that's uh, commonly referenced is that the, the average, you know, vehicle that, that sits in someone's driveway is only utilized, you know, roughly 5% of the time. And so when you look at mobility as a service, as an opportunity, you can crank that utilization way up, right? I mean, you can suddenly have vehicles on the road that are driving around all the time, uh, as long as they're able on a single charge. Um, and, uh, you know, you can really leverage that. Uh, so you reduce the number of vehicles on the road, you know, you can really uh, control the operations of that business. Um, you know, you can make that initiative green uh, and sustainable. Um, and there's all kinds of benefits that sort of go along with that. And you mentioned robo taxi. And when I hear the the phrase robo taxi, I just go straight into this like Blade Runner world where there's a little robots turning around. But I, I I assume it's not quite like that. Can you set the stage for what that sort of experience would look like? Yeah. Um, so I mean, think about your you know typical sedan. You've got four doors. Open it up. Sit down. There's a steering wheel and and a gas pedal. I mean, we we start there and basically remove most of those things. So. Uh, you don't uh, you don't open the door like you would in a conventional four door vehicle, right? We've got uh, we've got sliding doors that are actuated by um, you know remote touch. Um, you enter the vehicle, uh, you sit down. There's no steering wheel. There's no brake pedal. There's no gas pedal, right? It's a totally different reimagined experience, and and that experience really focuses on the rider. Um, so you know, it's, it's much less about, um, the act of driving from A to B and much more about the experience of enjoying, you know, your transit. Sounds good to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm in for that. As soon as I can not drive, I'm, I'll be pretty happy, I think. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And then you came in with an optics background. What were your original projects and how has that evolved over the years? Yeah, so I started uh, working on LiDAR, um, was focused on that with a, with a small team, um, you know, folks, and we were, uh, we were working on, you know, defining the technology roadmap for LiDAR for, for Zooks and, and what that looked like, you know, in the context of the greater sensor suite. Um, from there, just, you know, started growing our sensor engineering team, and uh, that includes uh, cameras, we have LiDAR, we have radar, we have thermal imaging, we have microphones. Um, we also have uh, other types of sensors that help to measure the, the position uh, of the vehicle uh, and the time, you know, so for example, uh, GPS and IMU sensors. Um, so yeah, uh, it just kind of grew, grew into that. 
I want to get more into the sensor technology in a moment, but I'm curious, what were some of the surprises for you as you transitioned from a more research-based environment like APL into a more, you know, it's obviously still research, but into automotive. Was there any anything that shocked you or surprised you as you made that shift? Yeah, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of similarities um, as well, uh, which are, you know, all really interesting, uh, a lot of parallels between the two industries. I think probably the biggest difference is that, you know, when you're designing for aerospace, um, you're, you're building a few of something, you're building, you know, a, a few uh, copies of, of your optical system for a telescope or whatever it might be. And those few copies that you make, need to work, right? I mean, when you have a balloon 120,000 feet in the air, or you have a spacecraft at Pluto, there's not a whole lot of opportunity for intervention there to fix it if it goes wrong. Um, You know, on the flip side, when you get into automotive, and this is one of the really exciting challenges, I think, in automotive is the volumes go way up. And you still need to have and maintain a very high bar for quality and reliability. So you can't just forget about that stuff. You still need it, even though the vehicles are serviceable and it's you know critically important. Uh, and you're manufacturing at a much larger scale. So that's one of the probably the biggest differences. It's interesting. The stakes are very high, but for very different reasons in both cases. That's right. Um, I mean, there are you know in aerospace, you do have. Uh, you know, manned missions, right? And, and there is an element of safety there um, that I think you're alluding to, right? Whereas you know, in autonomous vehicles, it's safety front and center. That's foundational to what Zoox is doing. And, um, you know, it's paramount that we protect our passengers. So. so what did you learn from your time at APL that transferred really well to Zoox? And what sort of, you know, unique approaches or ideologies did you bring over? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, at APL... Um, you know, it was a really great experience, learned a lot. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that APL does really, really well, um, you know, is systems engineering. Uh, and just from, you know, an overall perspective, how they approach complex systems, you know, requirements, design, validation, um, you know, the iterative approach to kind of get it right, you know, for these very complex spacecraft systems. Uh, and I think just having the opportunity to work on some of those complex systems and, and sort of learn from, you know, some really talented uh, senior folks there um, w- was was really useful when I went over to Zoox. Uh, you know, you think about autonomous vehicles, also very complex systems, you know, lots of components, interactions, hardware, software, the whole thing. Um, so, you know, using some of that, uh, that systems background, I think was really helpful. Awesome. You, you listed off some sensors that you're using earlier. I, I want to revisit that list. Can you talk through some of the different sensing technologies you're using and why that particular technology is useful for this case? Yeah. Um, so we use a number of different sensors. Uh, we've got uh, cameras, LIDAR, radar, uh, thermal imaging, microphones. Uh, I think I mentioned some of those earlier. Um, you know, each one brings its own advantages and disadvantages. So uh, we think of, you know, one example. So um, cameras, for example, visible imagers um, have really high resolution. You know, they can see fine details. They can also see in color. So that's incredibly important for things like traffic lights. Um, on on the flip side, cameras and visible imagers in particular tend to be more susceptible to adverse weather. So you think like rain, that kind of thing. Um, whereas, you know, other sensors like radar Uh, are really robust to weather. So driving in the rain, you know, in other conditions, radar might perform just fine. Um, But radar have their own disadvantages. So lower resolution, more susceptible to noise from clutter in the environment, um, things like that. So it's all a bunch of trade-offs. And the goal is to try and bring together, you know, a diverse set of sensors to, to really help solve the problem and provide our perception team with the most robust uh, data set possible to enable them to really help us solve autonomy. Microphones and thermal cameras are ones that I haven't heard about as much for for this use case. Can you explain why you would bring those in and what sort of data you're getting or what what sort of information you get from those that's unique versus like radar or uh, normal camera? Yeah, uh, so the thermal cameras, they allow us to detect a heat signature directly from the objects in the scene, directly from the objects we're viewing. So uh, visible cameras, by comparison, 
they only are able to see the reflected light from an object, um, you know, or emitted light from an object, but pedestrians don't normally emit light. So normally we have uh, sunlight that's getting reflected off of them during the day or street lamps reflecting off of them, you know, at night. And that's how we see them with thermal imagers. We can detect that heat signature, that thermal signature that's emitted from them directly. Um, so this really allows us to, to see the things that uh, I like to say, see the things that we love the most. So our, our friends, our family and our, our pet, our, you know, our furry friends, um, the, the thermal cameras do a great job with that uh, and really enhancing our, our safety case. Um, for the microphones, you know, they're super unique in that they're the only sensor that allow us to uh, detect uh, audible um, sound, right? So uh, when you think about use cases there, it's like emergency vehicles, being able to hear the sirens. So you can, you can detect the sirens and you can actually localize them uh, using microphones. Um, in addition, there's some other interesting use cases, like when something bumps into the vehicle, you can actually hear it. Uh, so you can get ahead of that. And, uh, and so, you know, we're exploring all kinds of interesting ways that we can use that data. Fascinating. You mentioned earlier that you're effectively pulling a, a lot of things out of the cabin, no more steering wheel, no more brake pedal. So it's really a ground up design experience. How does that impact how you're able to integrate sensors and new technologies and methods for for driving and collecting data yeah yeah um so we uh you know we have a, a bunch of features that we've designed into our ground up platform that uh, enable us to do and solve some of the problems that you alluded to so um, for example um we have four sensor pods on the vehicle one on each corner and if you look at our our vehicle concept the sensor pods are sort of offset a bit from the vehicle body and the way that we've designed it, that allows us to actually iterate uh, very quickly um, on, you know, the sensors that are in those pods. And when I say iterate, I mean, you know, introducing the latest and greatest technology and um, continuing to evolve uh, so that we can, uh, again, provide perception with uh, the best data product possible. Having the sensors out on those pods also gives us a big advantage when it comes to visibility. Um, you know, we can really see around the vehicle. Uh, we have LIDAR in those pods, um, mechanical spinning LIDAR that allow us to see that full 270 degrees uh, around each corner. You know, that's really powerful when it comes to visibility and, and overlap and, and all those good things that you want uh, in the sensor architecture. Um, so, yeah, just a few examples there. And then I imagine combining multiple types of sensor data gives you a much different picture than you would get from just one type of sensor. Can you talk to me about how you're integrating the data from the different sensors into something that's, uh, you know, greater than the sum of its parts? Yeah, uh, th there's some common approaches to that in, in industry. Um, and, you know, we've adopted some of those. So, for example, um, you can write detectors uh, or code, I'll say detectors that will uh, detect objects in each individual sensor. So, you know, what does the LIDAR see? What does the radar see, et cetera, uh, kind of independently. Uh, and then you can take that information and, and the data from those sensors in general and combine them and do sort of a fused approach where you say, all right, you know, not only do I care about what LIDAR sees, but I also want to weight what the camera sees, combining those together and improving the robustness of the detections. And so those are all, you know, techniques that we've used at Zoox uh, and, um, you know, are pretty common in the industry. Yeah, it sounds like a really fascinating engineering challenge for sure. What about reliability and uptime? Uh, what sort of, you mentioned cars being on the road all day earlier. How, how all day is all day? Yeah. Uh, so first, I mean, reliability and uptime are just super central to our, our business model, right? You know, the longer our vehicles are out there operating, taking passengers from A to B, um, obviously the more, you know, revenue is generated per vehicle. Um, so for us, when we talk about uptime, we've designed our vehicle again, you know, part of this ground up architecture that we've built, um, we knew early on that we wanted to be able to operate as long as possible on a single charge. So we've en engineered the vehicle to operate for, uh, up to 16 hours uh, on a single charge, um, you know, with our, our high voltage and, and power systems. That's a little different from a traditional automotive spec for reliability. Um, but that's, uh, that's a sweet spot for us. And in order to have these vehicles out there operating a continuous service, you know, providing uptime to the, to the passengers, um, 
The other aspect of our architecture, um, you know, that sort of supports that uptime is um, fail operational capability. So we've designed a lot of redundancy into our system so that if, you know, one particular thing goes down, we can continue to operate, you know, finish the ride safely, of course, um, and, you know, provide that uh, positive experience for our passengers. So to me, that's an insane goal to have 16 hour uptime uh, seven days a week. First question is, are are the batteries just massive or, or what does it take to get to that level of, of uptime? Uh, so the, the batteries that we designed uh, in the vehicle um, have a, a really large capacity. Combined, our, our two high-voltage batteries uh, have 133 kilowatt hours. That enables that 16-hour uh, uptime. So that was designed in kind of from the, from the get-go as part of this uh, ground-up architecture. So how much do power modes play into to uptime for, for the battery life? Context being, I recently got an e-bike and like the power mode that I'm in really impacts how long I can ride. Is that true for cars as well? It is. Uh, and for autonomous vehicles in particular, you could imagine that there are uh, moments when uh, driving scenarios are particularly complicated, right? And in those more challenging scenarios, the compute system might draw more power. Uh, just because those algorithms are, are working a little bit harder. Um, you know, there's uh, that sort of thing. There's this, the speed that you drive and, and other load conditions, you know, that have to be taken into account. Um, all that certainly plays, plays a role in, in calculating that. So you also mentioned redundancy being a big factor. And I, I saw that you have a patent, and I'm going to check my notes, for sensor obstruction detection and mitigation using vibration and heat, which I assume is like water, dirt, bugs parking under a tree that has a lot of birds, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, that patent, um, you know, it's, it's about dealing with obstructions basically and, and obstructions, all the ones that you mentioned, uh, they have the, the potential to degrade the performance of our sensors. Um, the degraded sensor data uh, can reduce the performance of our perception algorithms. I mean, not always, but it certainly can. Uh, and that can lead to unwanted false positives or, or false negatives. Um, you know, false positives being you sort of hallucinate an object that's not really there. False negatives uh, being uh, the one that we talk a, a lot about in safety. That's like missing something entirely. Uh, and of course, you don't want any any of those things. You don't want either of those things. Um, or you want to minimize them anyway. Uh, so some sensors are affected more than others. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about how visible cameras are more susceptible to rain than, say, radar is. Um, so it's really important that we characterize that degradation in those various environmental conditions and take action uh, as needed to mitigate that degradation. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty good space, I think, that's uh, ripe for, for innovation over the next few years. Okay. Do they then get refurbished or, or what does that sort of, you know, post prime lifespan cycle look like? Uh, you know, it's not that it's not that we don't expect to replace anything. So um, over that time period, we uh, because we own and operate the fleet, you know, we have an opportunity to basically service those vehicles as often as we want. Right. So we, we can constantly go in there and, you know, repair, replace, do whatever is needed, um, clean the vehicles, perform regular maintenance, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, and that, that is definitely one advantage to being vertically integrated. Will they be able to like go through a car wash or is that going to be a whole new, uh, new piece of work to invent? Yeah. So, you know, t- like technically, yes. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, when all that would happen, um, we haven't uh, revealed any sort of timelines for, for launch or other milestones like that. Um, but, but certainly from a technical capability perspective, yes. Okay. And then what's on the future for, for autonomous driving as an industry and in the future for Zooks? Where do you see this going and what sort of you know, cool technologies come in our way and how will it impact like, our daily lives? Yeah. Um, I mean, so many different ways to answer that. Uh, I think that from Zooks's perspective, you know, cornerstone to our mission is, uh, you know, providing autonomous mobility as a service to, to folks, you know, um, in a way that's sustainable in a way that's, you know, um, uh, accessible, you know, all those, uh, all those things are important to us. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of opportunities there, 
you know, one of the things I'm looking forward to is just less vehicles on the road, right? If, if we do this in the right way, we can move people around, you know, in cities, at least to start uh, and have less congestion, um, filling up fewer parking lots and getting people where they need to go quickly. And I think from a practical perspective, that, that'll be a really uh, powerful trans- transformation for the industry. Absolutely. And then last question for the sensors, what does redundancy look like if something goes down there? Is it backup sensors in the same cluster or can other clusters you know, help compensate? We've, um, I think, you know, kind of all of the above, but uh, just to expand a little bit on our strategy for the sensor architecture and, and how we think about which sensors and where we place them and why and all that stuff. Um, there's really two uh, core tenants, you know, to the sensor architecture. One is diversity. And, and that is to say, having different types of sensors. So having a camera and a radar and a LIDAR, you know, different types of sensors with different independent data products that complement one, one another and reduce, you know, coupled failure modes. Um, so that's the diversity piece. And then the other piece is redundancy. So that's, you know, multiple copies of the same sensor. So you'll have uh, many different cameras or, or multiple LIDAR basically with <clears throat> overlapping coverage so that if one goes down or is somehow degraded, you have other sensors that can pick up the slack. Uh, and so through a combination of this, you know, diversity and redundancy, we're able to build out this full 360, you know, robust coverage around the vehicle um, for that safety bubble. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And then to shift gears a little bit from the technology and the sensors into the people, what sort of engineering teams are employed at Zook and what should, what do you look for when you're looking for someone to be the next team member at Zooks? Uh, we have all kinds of disciplines represented at Zooks. Um, that's one of the super exciting things about, you know, working here and, and the fact that we're doing this vertically integrated thing is that we have a, a huge combination of people from different uh, technical backgrounds and experiences all kind of together. Um, in terms of uh, the, the types of folks, you know, that we're working, uh, that we're looking for, um, that we're trying to hire, um, you know, maybe the first thing to say is that we are hiring, you know, we're, we're growing, we're hiring. Um, we're, we're very fortunate to have the full support and backing of Amazon there. And we're, we're planning to add, uh, something like 500 people to the company this year. Um, we've had a lot of uh, success hiring so far in 2022. Um, and you know, the, the types of folks that we're working for, you know, motivated, inquisitive people, um, folks that want to be part of this once in a lifetime opportunity to really reshape transportation. Um, so yeah, just to name a few. Yeah. I, it's an incredible opportunity to solve problems that have never been solved that have a huge impact on the future of, of humanity. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, that was definitely one of the big um, drawing points for me when I was at APL looking at other opportunities in the industry. This really struck me as like, wow, this, it, it's pretty rare that you have a chance to embark on an engineering problem like this that will you know, have such a big impact on society. And speaking of an impact on society, I hear you're still teaching at Johns Hopkins. Are there, is there a course specifically that you teach there? Yeah, uh, I teach uh, Fundamentals of Engineering Space Systems. Uh, it's a two-semester course. It's in the graduate program there um, for their uh, space systems engineering degree. Very cool. How does that... How does that experience tie back into your day job? Do you, do you learn from this or pick up new trends from the students or how does that, how do those two things play together? Yeah, I, I think the, um, the foundation of systems engineering, you know, is just really important in both industries and whether it's space systems engineering or uh, systems engineering for an autonomous vehicle, um, there's a lot of parallels, you know, you need to focus early on on the requirements and really try and under, understand those as best you can. Uh, once you start to sort through that, um, there's definitely a lot of iteration, right? You design, you try, you go back and, you know, maybe I need this requirement or that one and, and you try again. And, um, you know, good systems engineering looks at, at the problem at a high level, uh, recognizing that it's a very complex system with lots of parts and interactions and there's hardware pieces and software pieces and they all play together. And, um, I think, you know, from that perspective, there, there's certainly a lot of, a lot of parallels between the aerospace side and, and the automotive side. Okay. 
So what are the big hurdles that you see for the future of the automotive industry? What challenges are engineers that are, you know, even just now being born going to have to be solving when they're in the field and trying to try to solve these things? That's a really good question. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to predict what the challenges uh, might be, you know, 5, 10, 20 years from now. I think that if we look at broad themes across the industry, um, you know, one area that's, you know, applicable sort of globally right now, and I think overlaps closely with autonomous vehicle tech uh, and automotive tech, um, is sustainability and energy. And I mean, just this year, we've seen pretty wild movements in the energy sector. Um, you know, just a few months ago, everyone feeling the pain of the pump and, and all that stuff. And I think energy is going to continue to be a really big deal. Uh, and, you know, here in California, there was actually a recent uh, ban on the sale of gas cars after 2035. And, you know, it's, it's really clear that we're going to need to focus on that uh, as a engineering community, um, you know, to find sustainable uh, sources of energy and, and to really move in that direction. Um, you know, one thing I really like about Zooks is, is that from the very beginning, we were committed to that, you know, sustainability concept and, um, you know, settled on our electric vehicle architecture, which we think will be a, an excellent way to, to kind of penetrate into the marketplace. But, but that'll certainly continue to be a focus, I think. When a mandate like that comes out from the state of California, I have to imagine there's like a mini party happening <laughs> in the Zooks office for, you know, the recognition of, of the future that you're trying to build. It's certainly good to see that there's there's a focus on moving towards, you know, sustainable, uh, you know, energy sources um, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot that's all wrapped into that. Right. I mean, climate change and everything else, um, which is a whole other separate topic of its own. Um, I think, you know, for us, we try not to focus too much um, on the external pieces in as much as, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we're delivering what we think is the right thing, consistent with that vision that we set out. Um, we, we really do believe in uh, in the EV platform um, and think that that's really the right way to kind of start solving this problem. Um, and we'll just sort of go from there. Fair enough. Good answer. As we run out of time, we like to do a lightning round at the end of these things. Quick off the wall questions, sometimes related, sometimes not. Who is, in your opinion, the best jazz saxophonist of all time? Oh man, hardest question of the day. Um, I think I'll I'll go with uh, Sonny Rollins. Uh, so I had a um, and there's a story. So I had an inspirational uh, band instructor growing up. Uh, his name's Andy Spang. He introduced me to jazz. Um, in one of our first lessons together, he played a, a song by Sonny Rollins called uh, St. Thomas. Um, it's a, you know, really saxophone focused tune. Um, and uh, between Andy and, and that song, I think it, it really shaped sort of my, my musical trajectory in jazz. So, uh, so I'd have to go with that. Okay. Uh, jazz, kind of pop culture. Are there any cases of pop culture TV, movie, book that got self-driving really right or any that got it really wrong? And do they pop up at all in the office? Oh, at, at Zooks, it, uh, it has to be Knight Rider. So um, we have our, our ground up robo taxi, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, going to be our product on public roads. But we also have a separate fleet of vehicles, uh, the Toyota Highlanders. That's our level three fleet. Uh, it has a human driver and everything else, um, a human operator. Um, but uh, we actually named those vehicles Kit. So an homage of oh. Knight Rider there. So <laughs> that, uh, that has to be my, my answer. Nice. And you said level three. Can you describe briefly the different levels of autonomy and how they're classified? Yeah, uh, just high level broad strokes here. So, you know, level one being the most sort of basic set of uh, autonomous functions, if you want to call them that. Um, I mean, L1 is essentially no autonomy. Um, you start thinking about things like the sort of cruise control that we have, uh, that we had, you know, maybe 10 years ago, right? Um, as you start progressing through the stages of autonomy, you get uh, to level three, um, where you have a human operator that's able to take over, you know, if anything goes wrong. Uh, and that's what our level three vehicles are. So we use those for um, testing, mapping, that sort of thing. Um, and then as you progress towards L5, uh, that becomes, you know, full autonomous operation, sort of generalized autonomy, if you will, uh, in any arbitrary uh, geofence. 
so you know you could you can basically drive anywhere uh, fully autonomous uh, without any expectation of intervention in any way. And that has to be the ultimate goal. Like if there's no steering wheel and no brake pedal, that's really where we're trying to be in a future state. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we, we take the approach of uh, crawl, walk, run. So we're definitely going to start in a well-defined geofence with our, our, first, uh, our first platform. Um, and we'll sort of incrementally grow from there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, level five sort of general autonomous operation is, is definitely the goal. Wonderful. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a blast. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. That was Ryan McMichael of Zooks. And thanks again to Mauser for sponsoring this episode of Moore's Lobby. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you are subscribed in your favorite podcast tool. And it would really help us out if you'd share this episode on social. Go check out the Moore's Lobby and All About Circuits social media pages. Thank you for joining me today in the lobby. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff, and I'll be right back here in two weeks with a special guest from AMD. AMD.